Hello class! Today we're going to be discussing the first half of the first day of John Perry's Dialogue on Personal Identity and Immortality. Here's some study guide questions to help us get started. 1. Who are our characters? 2. What does Wyrob want Miller to do? 3. What are two strategies for showing something is possible? 4. What is Miller's first attempt to answer Wyrob? 5. What is the point of the analogy with the tissue box? 6. What is the difference between qualitative identity and numeric identity? 7. Which two inferences are supported by qualitative identity? All right, those are our study guide questions, and as the video proceeds, you'll want to write down the answers or type them up or crochet them into a sweater or do whatever it is that you're doing to record the information. These are not something that you need to turn in, but they are a helpful way to compartmentalize and organize all of the information that we're going to uh, review in this course. In this dialogue by John Perry, we begin with three interlocutors, three characters who are going to be speaking to each other about philosophical matters over the course of the entire dialogue. First, there is Gretchen Wyrob. Wyrob is an atheist, and she is also dying. She'll be dead very soon, and all of the characters acknowledge this, some politely, some less politely, at the very outset. Secondly, there's also Sam Miller. Sam is a Christian. He believes that Wyrob's death will not be the end of her personhood. And then there is Dave Cohen, a Jewish man who also believes that Wyrob may have an afterlife in store for her, but doesn't share the same perspective as Sam. Now, at the very outset, right after everyone acknowledges that Wyrob will be dead soon, she says that what she'd like to do in her last few living hours is to have a rigorous philosophical discussion. That's her favorite thing to do. She is a philosopher, and so she'd rather go out doing that than anything else. Based on the circumstances, they decide to talk about the afterlife, and whether it makes sense at all to suppose that death is nothing more than the complete end of Gretchen Wyrob. Sam Miller believes in an afterlife. He believes that Gretchen Wyrob will live on in some sense, some yet-to-be-specified sense, whereas Gretchen Wyrob doesn't think this at all. They decide this for their topic, and they immediately begin to talk about the idea of survival. Wyrob clarifies that for there to be really such a thing as the afterlife, for her to really in some sense survive her death, even though that's strictly a contradiction. If I tell you that a plane crashed and everyone died, it doesn't make sense to ask about the survivors. Surviving means that you didn't die. But putting that aside, here's what Wyrob wants Miller to do. She wants Miller to show that it's possible for a person to exist after Wyrob's death whose experiences Wyrob can look forward to having. She wants Miller to show that it's possible for her to anticipate more experiences after her death. Miller, of course, balks at this and says, what do you mean, show that it's possible? Just imagine that it happens. Imagine that you die, and then there you are. How, how, what else is there to do? And here is a good time to talk about what Wyrob is really asking for. Wyrob wants Miller to show that something is possible. Now, that's a very strange sort of question, because ultimately, a thing's being possible is kind of the default. Unless there's some reason to think that something is impossible, you should assume that it's possible. In general, when faced with some proposition, the burden of proof is for someone to show that that proposition couldn't happen, that it can't be the case, rather than having to show that it could be. So when philosophers want to know that something is possible, they often express this by also supplying a reason for thinking that it's not. So philosophers will say, how can people enjoy tragedies given that they make us sad? How is it possible for material objects to exclude each other? 
given that each material object is co-located with its matter? How is it possible to choose what you know to be bad, given that every choice is directed at the best option? When philosophers want to know how something is possible, they'll ask, how is x possible given that y? And that's actually what y Rob does here. She asks, how is it possible for a person to exist after my death, whose experiences I can look forward to, given that my death consists in the dissolution of my body? She points out that once she's dead, she will be interred, that she will rot, that she will disintegrate, or if she's cremated, she will be burned away. She will be gone. Given that she will be gone, how is it possible for there to be, then, a person later who is her. How is it possible for Wyrob to anticipate post-mortal experience, given that her death means that she won't exist? Now, when philosophers are tasked to show that something is possible, to show that despite some consideration it could actually happen, there are two strategies for doing this. One way to show that something is possible is to show that it can be clearly imagined. Show that it is imaginable, in other words. You can often show that something is imaginable by drawing a picture or a diagram or describing it in a very vivid way. So if someone asks how it's possible for there to be a three-dimensional shape with only one side, you could show them a Mobius strip. Or if someone asks how it's possible for three grains of sand to make up a heap, you draw a diagram that shows one grain of sand and another grain of sand and then a third stacked on top to make a little heap sort of shape. That's one way to show that something is possible, is you show that it can be clearly imagined, that it can be vividly pictured, in other words. Now one limit on this method is that not everything you can picture is actually possible. For instance, thanks to the brilliant work of M.C. Escher, we can vividly imagine a staircase in three-dimensional space that is always going upward and curving in on itself. That is clearly imaginable, but it's not actually possible. That can't exist in three-dimensional space. Now the other way to show that something is possible is to show that it's conceivable, to show that you can make sense of it, in other words. And the way that you do this is to give a clear account of it to give a clear explanation of its workings in a way that does not involve any contradiction or absurdity. As an example, ask this question. Is it possible for a white egg to have exactly 10,000 little red spots on it? That seems possible. Why couldn't there be such a thing? But now ask, are you able to clearly envision such a thing? Can you count all 10,000 of the spots in your imagination and make sure that they're exactly 10,000? Probably not. And it would also take a while to draw one, and let's be honest, you wouldn't need to draw one in order to know that it's possible. How do you know that it's possible then? Well, you make sense of the idea. You can talk your way through this idea that you have an egg with certain surface area and there's little speckles that could go on it which are so small that you could have 10,000 of them on there and no more. Once you describe it and establish that there's no contradiction in that description or any other absurdity, there. That's a reason to think it's possible. Now, while this method is not absolutely infallible, most philosophers agree that conceivability is a better guide to possibility than imaginability. So, those are the two ways to try to show that something is possible, show that it's imaginable, or show that it's conceivable. And then we get Miller's first strategy for showing that why Rob's afterlife is possible. Miller goes for imaginability. Miller says, imagine that several thousand years from now, two people meet. I am one of them, you are another one. There. We imagined it, it's, so it's clearly possible. What is impossible about that? Why Rob again reminds Miller that she will have already disintegrated, she will have already died, and that's the reason to think that that situation, though imaginable, is not really possible. She then emphasizes the point by mentioning a tissue box with a certain brand name. She points out that if she were to take 
this specific tissue box and burn it, there's no way that that tissue box, that very one, could be the same tissue box as some other one that comes along later. Miller objects. Sure there could. It could be identical in every respect. It could be exactly like it. And why Rob chides Miller for confusing things. Let's not follow Miller and be confused ourselves. There are two separate notions at work here, both related to the idea of identity. Let's distinguish between qualitative identity and numeric identity. Qualitative identity is exact similarity. That's what qualitative identity is, exact similarity. A and B are qualitatively identical as long as A and B are exactly similar. They have exactly the same features. They resemble down to the finest detail. That's what qualitative identity is. Qualitative identity is very, very close or exact similarity. When we say that identical twins are identical, we mean that they're qualitatively identical. When a number of golf balls come off of the golf ball factory and they all look exactly alike, we could say that each one of those golf balls is qualitatively identical to the next. Note that many distinct things can be qualitatively identical. Or at least most philosophers think so. Leibniz and a few of his followers didn't. Check out the first video on this channel, as a matter of fact, I, co I covered this topic. Contrast that with numeric identity. Numeric identity is the relation that each thing bears to itself. No two things can be numerically identical. If they were numerically identical, what we would have is one thing. For example, Mark Twain is numerically identical to Samuel Clemens. They're not two different people, Mark Twain and Samuel Clemens. They're exactly the same person. There's only one guy, two different names, but one person. That's what it means to say they are numerically identical. Note that grammar is constraining me to use the plural here, but one thing. Each thing is numerically identical to itself. No thing is numerically identical to any other thing. You could say numerically identical to means the same thing as one and the same as. Note that numeric identity entails qualitative identity. Each thing that exists is exactly like itself at any given time. Nothing can be taller than itself at the very same time, or bigger than itself, or smaller than itself, or a different color than itself, at least if you're talking about the very same part of the thing at the exact same time. But qualitative identity does not entail numeric identity. From the fact that A and B are exactly alike, it doesn't follow that there's just one object, which is both A and B. No, you could have two things that are exactly alike. Philosophers are interested in numeric identity because there are two sorts of inferences, two kinds of conclusions you can draw that involve numeric identity. One of them is the following. A has feature F. A is numerically identical to B. Therefore, B has feature F. That is an inference supported by numeric identity. And it makes sense. If Mark Twain drinks several whiskeys every day, and if Mark Twain is the same person as Samuel Clemens, well then, Samuel Clemens drinks several whiskeys every day. That's because they're the same guy. It just follows from the fact that they're the same guy. If Mark Twain wears a white suit, and Mark Twain is Samuel Clemens, that means Samuel Clemens wears a white suit, and so on. This gets interesting in philosophy when we start to have arguments like this. A human being is just their body. Human beings can be virtuous. So, human bodies can be virtuous. The other sort of inference that numeric identity supports is this one. A has feature F. B does not have feature F. Therefore, A is not numerically identical to B. They are distinct. This one should also make sense if you think about cases. If the evil pirate is a one-handed man, and Peter is not a one-handed man, 
then the evil pirate is not Peter. And we can in fact use this second inference to show what is wrong with Miller's first attempt to convince Wyrob of the possibility of the afterlife. The future person Miller describes has not rotted away or disintegrated. They're right there, integrated. But Wyrob would have disintegrated. And so they're not the same person. Now, it's at this point in the first day of the three-day dialogue that Miller begins to describe his mind-body dualist view, which is connected to his Christianity. He begins to talk about the idea of a soul, and that's where we'll pick up with the next video for this week. I'll see you next time when we finish up day one of Perry's dialogue on personal identity in immortality.